the problem with with our own egos is that we want we like to be correct in identifying how people are feeling. So a lot of times we like to guess and tell people, oh, I know you're feeling this way. I know you're feeling that way. But one of the most helpful things you can do in actually making somebody calm down is putting the ball in their court in that, you know, letting, you know, just saying that you have no idea how scary something is, or I, I can't imagine what you're feeling right now. I have no idea what you're feeling Ooh, right I now. Oh, I gotta go. I've been working, so them please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. Swear I paid all my fees. I was starving for this day. Now my fan they can't eat. Hey everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Cup of Nurses show. Here with your hosts, Peter and Matt, two nurses on a mission to change this world one conversation at a time. So let's jump right into it. If you find value on this show and want to join us on this mission, please share and review the show. It would mean absolutely everything to us. Cupofnurses.com for the latest info, updates, and all the merch releases. For our lifestyle podcast, you can check out wearefrontlinewarriors.com. In this episode, we would like to introduce you to Sean O'Connor. Sean is a licensed mental health counselor at Peaceful Living Mental Health Counseling in Scarsdale, New York. Sean specializes in sports psychology and trauma-informed counseling to help adults and athletes overcome anger, depression, anxiety, PTSD, and stress. He uses a combination of EMDR therapy, mindfulness, and meditative science, polyvagal theory for nervous system regulation and neurofeedback when working with clients. Sean loves working with athletes and survivors of past trauma to help them heal from the past, love the present, and have hope for the future. Thank you, Sean, for being here. Thank you so much for your time. Can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and the type of clients that you currently are working with or seeing? Yeah. So, um, yeah, and thank you for having me. Um, I was laughing because, uh, this is stuff that I normally talk about with friends and family, almost to the point where they probably want me to shut up. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to just be invited to talk about it. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I, I've been an athlete my entire life. Um, as soon as I could walk, started playing three sports and, was always uh, had relative ease with school, but until um, when I got to high school is when, you know, I'd like to, for cinematic effect, I'd like to say, oh, I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life. Um, but I've kind of always known that I wanted to do this in some way, shape or form, uh, guide, mentor, counsel, coach, teach. Um, it's just always kind of been in my, uh, the fabric of my being. And when I got to um, the later years of high school, and into college, it was actually senior year of high school, I took an intro to psychology class. Um, and there was like a morality and ethics section in there. And that's when I really remember falling in love with with this science. Um, it, 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 it allowed me the opportunity to explore everything that I love exploring. Um, and that nothing is ever really 100% concrete. It's all, you know, theoretical, um, as much evidence as there is scientifically now, we still have, um, so much that we don't know and I think that that's there's nothing more fascinating than that and how I got into um I got into doing sports psychology or, or sports psychology informed therapy um with a mixture of my own experience as an athlete um both on the field and off the fields um and found that there was an opportunity to be both uh a coach and more of a guy and more of a um emotional support at the same time. And I got to combine both of those two things that I love doing. Um, and that's how I really I kind of almost tripped and fell into it. Um, if there is one, there's one moment, um, and I could say this is the binoculars of hindsight, but I, I really remember uh, one specific moment my, uh, in college um, when I, one of my best friends that was on my team, I realized was having trouble. Like we were mid game. And he had made a mistake that really changed the momentum of the game. And when I was talking to him about how he felt about trying to calm him down, he was more preoccupied with 
how his father was going to respond to the mistake that he made rather than how the team was going to respond, how we were going to do, if we were going to win or lose, how coach was going to respond. And I just remember being kind of slapped across the face at that moment. Like there is such a component to, to, to athletic competition off, you know, that has um, everything to do or has everything to do with everything else, but your skill level, um, the, like the mental part of it. And I think that planted the seed um, just kind of, that was like the culmination of a lot of different experiences I had had off the field where I realized how much um, help a lot of athletes need. And let's see from there. Um, I actually, I graduated with my, my undergraduate degree and I was able to uh, uh, get into grad school and find out that I could play again. So looking back on it as well, that's another big reason why I got into this because I, with the, I know we're going to talk about like the cultivation of identity in athletes, but I had the opportunity to um, kind of retire twice and feel what that's like um, to have, to, to, to no longer be a part of it, get it back and then lose it again, uh, not lose it again, but like it, it, it came to its um, culmination. And that was another big, big factor, big reason why I wanted to get into this work because so many athletes also have a hard time with uh, what, what else am I good at? What else can I do? What else is my identity related to besides how I can perform in sports? Um, so that's, that's how I got into the sports part of it or wanting to aim it that way. Um, but I got into the trauma work um, mainly with my inpatient um, psychiatric hospital experience um, that I could take a whole episode to talk about, but briefly that was an opportunity to see some of the worst, you know, the worst, um, you know, stress responses that a human can have, you know, into, in, in response to what happens in life. And it felt like after a while, um, there was something missing. Like we were treating, um, so many symptoms and so many, uh, indirect causes of the things that people were suffering with. And I realized that, um, that it, there was something we were missing. Um, there's something deeper there as to why people are suffering so much and that people don't just arbitrarily wake up one day and feel the way that they do, that it is a, a process. It's something that happens to people. So that's where I really shifted to seeing things from like what, what happened instead of what's wrong or what's broken, uh, what needs to fix. Um, so shifting that perspective was really, really helpful. And that's where I've landed now in working with, I work with both current athletes, um, people who have an athletic background, like they've played or competed in a lot of different sports throughout their life. And now they're, um, you know, the different things that they're involved with now, their work life, their home life, their social life, um, they, they still speak that language, um, you know, the language of, an, of a competitive athlete. And I work with various forms of PTSD, um, you know, shock traumas, developmental trauma, um, structural trauma, you know, I mean, just about everyone has some level of complex traumatic stress in response to COVID. Um, so that's also, um, that's been a, a, a contextual thread with everybody's narrative that I've worked with. Nobody has gone without some extra stress because of, you know, the pandemic in the last two, three years. Sean, I wanted um, to ask you, yeah. what is sure. the language of an athlete, that sports psychology aspect of it? It's very fascinating you said that word. I've never heard anybody use that. Uh, the way I envision things is just early on, just like you played sports, for me it was soccer. And all the time, it was a very team-based approach. So whenever, for example, you're running a mile or two miles and the faster people finish, they actually run back and help the people that are struggling. Because if you don't make that mile mark, whatever the goal was for the team, we would reset and run another mile or two. Mm -hmm. And it was very uh, built around teamwork. So what is the, the language of an athlete? Right. So that, that's the first and foremost is gaining the trust of an athlete in this setting is the same thing as when you gain, you know, your trust of, of your teammate, when you kind of, uh, when you, when you're seen as a participant in their narrative, like you're, you're, you're asking them to be vulnerable and let you in to, um, all these parts of their life that, um, that they're very used to keeping kind of closed off because they're afraid of that stigma, uh, uh that, they're going to be um, that they can't solve problems on their own, that they can't just mentally will themselves to do something. Um, 
they can't solve it quickly. That's another part of the language is, is um, understanding that they're very, that, that things are time constrained, but that psychotherapy is not something that can be rushed. Although there are methods of doing it now, um, as I'm sure you've talked about yesterday about EMDR, that like there are methods of doing therapy that are quicker than traditional talk therapy, but it's not something that you can just mentally decide to do differently. Like, okay, I'm just going to decide to start thinking differently, or I'm going to decide to want it more. And then all of a sudden that happens. Um, it's a process that occurs. Um, so the language, you know, it's speaking to them um, in an analogous way with, I use a lot of physical injury um, and examples, uh, like talking about I don't know, the defense mechanisms that people have are like insecurities, flaws, uh, difficult emotions. Um, I'll talk about how we get very used to feeling and thinking that way, just as if you were injured and you're kind of put in a cast or a sling for a while. And that keeps that body part like very, uh, very limited in its range of motion. And the first time you go and do physical therapy for it, uh, it really hurts just to move it, just to flex it a bit, just to move it another degree. Um, and that's kind of what therapy can be like in the beginning with, with, um, with athletes that kind of going into that uncharted, like emotional territory can feel very, very painful, very uncomfortable. Um, and, it, and it's one of those things that gets worse before it gets better a lot of the time. So just really, really speaking to them in a way that they're used to, you know, um, they're used to hearing that they do play a role in that, in getting better. Um, that it's not just all that, like the coach can't do it all for you. Um, but just more of an emphasis on that. This is a joint effort and this is a relationship to so give a relationship with your coach, give a relationship with your therapist and they're there to, um, you know, confront you when appropriate, but also unconditionally positively regard you when appropriate as well. Is there like a common theme or a common struggle that, a lot of athlete, athletes struggle with or have a hard time getting past because <clears throat> when you take an athlete, for example, you look at him, you know he's a physically healthy individual and mm -hmm. he's playing sports. Like it's, it's awesome. Like I would love to be, in a, be a, like an athlete. I love to play football. Like just playing a sport for four or five years of your life sounds like, like a dream come true for, for most people, right? And then you see him in this, this healthy physical shape and you sometimes think like, how could they be at a bad mental space? How can they be playing mm. sports as their career and be in tip top physical shape and then still have these struggles mentally? So what are these actual athletes struggle with? Is it like a self-confidence issue? Is it like a self-sabotage issue? Because they're in peak physical form, but they're not in, in peak mental form, you could say. So is it like a common theme that all these athletes struggle with? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment. I've, I've got several ideas. I just wanna take a moment to kind of think about where to go at that from um, the common theme I'd say is the same, the same life circumstances that drive the, the tenacity and the work ethic uh, kind of like that motor that athletes have where they just never hit a potential. They can just always push harder and harder. The same life experiences that create that and allow people to perform the way that they do very often are the things that create the emotional struggle struggles when they're not being stimulated like that by competition, um, family dynamics, um, uh, you know, issues with authority. Um, sometimes people's families live vicariously through their competition. They get treated differently, whether they win or lose, um, or they just, they experience massive amounts of traumatic stress and, um, and disconnectivity from others. And then the team and the coaches become very familial. Um, and that, that is healing to a point. And then when you're, but, but it's not translatable to every aspect of life. So that that's, I'd say the most common thing that I see is every every athlete that I work with has the sport is ingrained in them in, in, in some way um, in that it, it's a channel for like other, it's where they recycle a lot of their, more stressful experiences in life and then they kind of run into a wall where it no longer it no longer fits mm. so it almost sounds like 
not feeling worthy of yourself as an athlete is a benefit because they are a workhorse to get things done right and they perform at their best but once that energy is not ventilated anymore because they've used that sport to do that they hit just like you're saying that mental wall of like Mm -hmm. wow like do i deserve the peak of everything i'm experiencing Mm -hmm. all these championships and then uh I, i don't know where they realize they have a problem where they come to you in this case but it seems like that's like a theme where you know having a rough household just like in, in our case also actually motivated us to do more because we always put our energy into work in a mm-hmm. sense so i kind of mm-hmm. see that theme as athletes as well as their identity is just being a workhorse and it, it's yep. a benefit to them and then i'm curious uh shonda then do a lot of athletes struggle from finding purpose after they stop playing that sport because they have so much physical time devoted to it and plus all that mental work that they put in and you said, you know, they like to compete. So now you take that off the table due to an injury or just due to their, their career ending, just because, you know, sometimes it, it just ends. Do they have a hard time transitioning into, for example, like normal society because they don't have that sport or that competitive place to lean on anymore or that team or those coaches. So what happens then? Absolutely. That's one of the biggest threads um, of like, pre- that's one of the biggest presenting problems when an athlete comes in for therapy is, I can't play anymore because of an injury or I've retired because I didn't make it to the next level or, uh, you know, just all the reasons people stop playing. What do I like? What do I do now? What else am I good at? Um, What else is stimulating enough that I want to do it? Even if I am good at it, do I want to do it? Is it rewarding enough physically? Um, Just kind of having a real difficult time like lowering the, the the bar a little bit. And I say that it's a, that's a very foreign concept for athletes too, is saying like, you have to lower your expectations a little bit with what the rest of the world can offer. Cause if you're playing, you know, short of going into like military law enforcement, private security, um, you know, and all other jobs that maybe have more of a um, chaotic environment, mm. most jobs, most things that people can do when they're not playing sports are just not engaging the same way the sport is. Um, and, and that's a, that can come off as I'm depressed because the world suddenly goes from color to more black and white Mm. because nothing's really grabbing them the same. Um, that's yeah. Like that's one of the, absolutely. That's one of the biggest, biggest challenges that they face. So uh, then, when you're done. So Sean, how do you find them, find that purpose then? Like, how do you, when somebody comes in and, and says, like, Sean, like, football has been everything to me, and now my relationship's suffering, my kids are suffering, I just can't figure any, anything out. How, how can they get started in finding that purpose or, like, a sense of direction? So I get to, I take the same approach that I do with other um, other clients, even then non-athletes. Like, I get to know their whole story. Mm-hmm. Um, again, like, to be a participant in all aspects of their life and at the end of the day when someone trusts that they can be vulnerable around you um they will let they will let you in to know what what their deeper feelings are and then when you get to that you can really help guide somebody towards what what's going to be good for them um when people are when people have a wall up and they're not really getting into how they feel what really drives them what what um what are they passionate about what what like pays them without an income you know, without money, um, what's on their mind constantly day to day. Um, when you learn that, then you can kind of help guide people towards the things that, you know, uh, again, ultimately it's going to be their decision, but you can help guide them towards the things you think that will stimulate them that same way. Mm. And like that, find, find a purpose, find something that where they're, they're going to be a teammate. They're going to have teammates. They're going to be a teammate to other people. And they're going to be able to, um, you know, leave some kind of imprint, make some kind of mark in whatever it is that they do. Mm. But the vulnerability is the biggest, the biggest factor. And I, I've also found that once you help someone understand something with their performance, um, it, whether it's reflective on how they used to play or what, how they're currently playing, it's like you solve that. And then all of a sudden there's this big emotional dump. It's like the, the, the sports performance piece is like the, the hallway, uh, into the rest of the house. You know, you, you, somebody comes in and like, they have the yips, like they, um, they can't, uh, like pitchers that can't throw strikes anymore. Golfers that, that can't tee off 
uh, basketball players that can't shoot a free throw, like all of the tasks and sports that really require a lot of mental focus and like slowing down a little bit. Um, they won't be able to do that. But then once you help them and they see that pay off, it's like the next session is like, Oh yeah. Also, you know, this abuse, this bullying, stress, uh, these insecurities, anxiety, depression, like all of the off the field or off the court things start to come out after you kind of latch on to helping them with that one thing with their performance. Mm -hmm. So like usually when you, that I guess goes back to your question about um, like the language, like that's, that's one of the ways to, to learn to speak their language is to help them with something skill-based mm -hmm. and then everything else kind of follows that. It's easier. It's more tangible for the mind to see progress in a skill set, just like you said, versus mentally, this is not stressing me because they're, they're not embodying maybe their body as much to notice that difference versus, hey, I'm shooting my threes right now because I'm actually controlling my breathing versus being in this traumatic, uh, traumatic response. Absolutely. Yeah, that, it, yeah that's, um, that's always really, really helpful. Like find something that's measurable when they can measure their success. Because a lot of the other uh, progressions in therapy are a lot harder to measure, mm. and it can feel a lot like a roller coaster. You know, the, the 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 trajectory is not always upward. You know, people hit um, roadblocks. People feel a lot better. Then sometimes they feel worse again. They feel better again from that point. Um, and to the mind and to the language of the athlete, when they don't see things, um, when they're putting a lot of effort in, and they still don't see things progressing the way that they want as if they were practicing a skill and watching that thing progress, mm -hmm. they can get very discouraged and tell themselves it's not working. Or even the other stigma uh, that comes up is that they don't want it enough or they're not working hard enough. And being told that you're not working hard enough or telling yourself that brings up all the other, um, you know, household things that I mentioned before where somebody feels inadequate or not good enough. It's like, no matter how hard I try, I still can't enact change in my life in the way that I want. Mm -hmm. um, so like the feelings of helplessness or powerlessness um, just kind of fester from there. It's funny because when I was younger playing soccer, when I, whenever I got the ball, I always got into like fight or flight and I had no peripheral vision, man. I was just so laser focused. Yeah. I couldn't see where my athletes were. And as I practiced mindfulness more and I was more calm with the ball, I was able to actually see the full pitch. Mm. And yep. for anybody that's a non-athlete, because most of our listeners are, how do you cultivate this identity of an athlete? What are the, the values or character traits that it takes to be an athlete? Yeah. So for first and foremost, uh, you have to be, uh, you have to be okay with, with failure, with failing multiple times over and over again before, before you get really good at something. Um, the demands of any sport are, are not something that come, you know, to some people, it really looks like they were born to do it. Like they just came out of the womb and they could move that way. They could move their body in space that way, but even they had to develop those skills. Um, but they, I think their identity starts from the earliest years where it's just, are you a winner or are you a loser? Did your team win or did your team lose? And then it gets more nuanced from there as you get older. Um, the competition gets more, um, more complex and like you, you, you're able to feel differently about yourself. You, know, you can separate how you feel about how you played versus how the team did and vice versa. Um, so it's not just solely based on whether you win or lose. Um, I think an athlete, one of the ways that it helps in life too, is you, you're able to, um, to tolerate failure and to tolerate things being difficult a lot easier. Um, understanding that, that take, that's a process and that takes, that's something that takes time and not, again, not just something that you can mentally will yourself into doing differently. Um, what else? Yeah. Being, being there for others, um, putting the needs of others before your own. Um, you know, my coaches growing up always said that if you, you know, if you care about the, you know, the guy to your left and right more than yourself, everybody's taken care of. And that's what, you know, that's what makes a team. Um, so that's a big part of their identity as well. Yeah, I think it gets more social as you get older too, like your relationship to your coach and your team and your teammates. Um, 
because it, it just becomes a family. It becomes a, it becomes the people that you interact with on the daily. You live with them. You train with them all summer or when you're not in school. Um, you know, coaches can take the place of like the parental authoritative figures in your life while you're living around them and seeing them and interacting with them every day. So navigating that is pretty tough. Yeah, and yeah. then going to to back to Matt's Matt's point of him playing soccer and he got like the ton of vision, the fight and flight response. Is there and I'll carry this over not just to athletes, but I guess this is going to work in anybody in a stressful situation. So for example, when you have an athlete that gets um I don't know if I'll call it shell shock, but gets a ton of vision, gets super um super an- anxious during times uh when I have to perform. For example, like in a Super Bowl, you got got the uh, wide receiver, you know the ball is going to him, and then he he performs well, but then when the pressure is on him or when the light is on him, they for some reason fail. So, is there any exercise they could do, or or what should they be doing to kind of calm themselves down in in like to fight that stage fright? Is there anything they could do in that moment to kind of center themselves and have a full view on the field so they can get out of that tunnel vision kind of mindset? How do, how do they snap out of it when they're under stress? For example, a lot of our viewers are healthcare professionals, so there's times in, in the night, for example, in the ICU where somebody starts coding, and then you freak out, you're very tunnel vision, trying to figure out what to do, and you sometimes you just underperform because you know what to do, but when that when that actual code happens, you almost forget what to do. So mm-hmm. what, are, what are some good ways to get yourself back in this grounded state where you can now focus on your knowledge because you know you have the skills to do this and you had the knowledge? How do you jump back into reality and not be so focused on like this tunnel vision and this, and this stressor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's one of the things that a lot of people struggle with. And that is another part of what allows people to perform at the highest level in front of hundreds, you know, hundred thousand people on national TV, you know, where their salary is dependent on it. Um, There's so much riding on it, like you said, and this will tie into um, also you know, the polyvagal stuff with, with a, how do you access what you call your vagal break, which is the, um, the, uh, to answer your question simply, what I tell people to do is as frustrating as it is to hear breathing is, is the, the, the power lever to your nervous system. And that's what that, all that is when you're, when you're in those moments and you can't access what you know, you know how to do, or the, or like, for coding um, in, in a medical emergency, what, the part of your brain that has all that knowledge and that skill um, where it's able to be recalled is only online if the other two branches of your nervous system that control our fight or fight response, control our shutdown or collapse, freeze, fainting response, if those, are, are, um, if those have been spoken to that they can relax. And that it's okay. Like you're not threatened. There's nothing organically, uh, you know, there's no real life or death danger here. Um, whatever happens in this moment. Um, well, actually I should say life or death with, uh, with the sport more, but even for yourself, even if you're witnessing someone else in a life or death situation, if, if you, if your nervous system, if you know, and you feel viscerally in your body that, the threat is not something that you um, can't handle. Only then you can access what you really know how to do. So breathing, um, you know, particularly longer exhales than inhales are how you kind of press the brake on your nervous system and really calm that response and kind of close that outer part of your brain where all that higher knowledge and that abstract thought and reasoning and um, all that information lies you know, so you, so you can take on the challenges that are in front of you. Um, so I always do a, a ton of breath work. It's just so tough because that sounds so cliche and so like pop psych to people when you say, oh, you just have to breathe. And they're like, yeah, don't tell me that. Everybody tells me that I just have to breathe. And it's like, no, wait a second. Um, breathing is not just something that we involuntarily do. Like you can, you can really consciously do it and totally change, you know, the, the, um, the flow of energy throughout your body. So it always starts starts with breath work. I love how you said that that's very pop because same thing in the healthcare. If you tell a patient to relax and breathe, they do the opposite yeah. of relaxing and breathing. They get very, um, they 
it's it's like we stimulate their fight or flight even more. It's like, don't you see? I am trying, but I can't breathe. I need some oxygen, and they go into that whole thing. So when right. it com- when it comes to improving it's, your, I'm sorry, God. I was gonna say, yeah, it's it's like they um, how they feel if they think that you're just telling them to just breathe and that'll solve all, how they feel. It's only, it makes them feel worse because that gets communicated that nobody really knows how I feel. Like this problem feels so big for them that just breathing wouldn't be a viable solution. So when someone's just telling them um, blindly to just breathe, it strengthens that that disconnect socially, mm-hmm. like that people aren't understanding how they feel, then further sending them down that fight or flight because they're they're feeling further disconnected right. from other people. And so letting them know, saying, yeah. So is there a better way of saying it? Is there like another another way we could say it? Because I tell my patient all the time, just relax, breathe, and they're always like, like yeah. w- worse. Ashan said something mm-hmm. very important. He said to be heard, mm-hmm. to be understood, and a lot of our patients or people in general don't feel understood. Mm-hmm. So even though they they share their need, there's this good disconnect because maybe the nurse isn't using empathy the right way to say, "Hey, I understand how you're feeling. X, Y, and Z is happening, but do this." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, always. Um, you know, listening, of course, you know, in a crisis situation, there's not always a lot to listen to, but validate, truly validating somebody's feelings, um, that not that they're not that what they feel is hundred percent accurate and the, you know, the end all be all the objective reality, but letting them know that what that, that it makes sense that based on what's going on, that someone could feel that way. You know, it makes, there's some, there's, there's somewhat, uh, there's, there's definitely a significant amount of logic to them feeling that way based on what they're going through. Mm-hmm. And we have the problem with, with our own egos is that we want, we like to be correct in identifying how people are feeling. So a lot of times we like to guess and tell people, Oh, I know you're feeling this way. I know you're feeling that way. But one of the most helpful things you can do in actually making somebody calm down is putting the ball in their court in that, you know, letting, you know, just saying that you have no idea how scary something is, or I, I can't imagine what you're feeling right now. I have no idea what you're feeling right now. Um, I want, you know, that to answer your question, you can tell them, I have no idea how this feels for you. I want you to, I, you know, I want you to help me help you by letting me know that. And we can better have a conversation about what you're feeling. You know, if we do with it, a few things to calm your body down first, mm-hmm. you know, breathing, um, you know, the, all the, all the various things we do to calm people that way. Um, but let, that's the key is validating until the person feels validated, not when we think that they've been validated enough. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a real good way to navigate conflict in general, but especially with somebody that's very emotionally disturbed in the moment. Um, cause they're, if they're in a crisis or, you know, or if you have, a someone with a psychiatric problem, that's not grounded in reality. Um, just, just letting them know that you can tell that something doesn't feel right. And you want them to educate you on what they're feeling. Mm. You, yeah. Cause that's how we evolved. I mean, we, our species made it this long in history because we understand the power of a group, mm. um, other, you know, like Neanderthals and other more primitive versions of, of ourselves. Uh, it was like kill or be killed. They didn't understand that collaboration and cooperation socially is how you survive and how you how you rise to the top of the food chain um so it's in our nature to to felt uh, to feel understood by other people mm. and once once that happens you know those more primitive parts of your nervous system will calm and then the social engagement system which is the newest most uh most recently evolved part of the nervous system um, that, that allows you to then have the conversation and kind of put a plan together, strategize, talk through situations, talk through crises. Yeah. It's almost you, like yeah. the only way you could, you could grow on like a mental level or a societal level is communicating to others is mm-hmm. having the ability to understand yourself and then realize that your understanding is not someone's understanding. And the only way you get their understanding is by speaking to them. Like, because we all live in this life together. We all run from that, that tiger at one point, but it's like, how did running from a tiger make you kind of feel? You, you felt running from a tiger was a little bit easier because for example, you ran this way because you did more of like a sidestep. And I felt this way about a tiger because I didn't sidestep. So he got me, you know? So it's like, 
like going back to the primary level is like communication, you learn how to survive better together. And we took that from like a physical sense to now a more of a mental sense where it's not as like a co collaboration to physically fight off something. It's a collaboration to physically grow on, on the mental aspect. Yeah, I almost see it as like AI, right? Mm -hmm. AI is not as smart if you don't feed it data so it learns. Same thing with a human because yeah. of collaboration group, we feed our brain AI more data and we're able to better collaborate and maybe... Like you said, take a better sidestep or know when to cut a quick right and, and et cetera. Yeah. So I'm curious, Sean, how important is physical health to to mental health? Because personal experience, I'm sure you could also agree with me, is when someone asks or when someone comes up to me and talks to me and says like they're in a bad place in life or they're in a bad mood, or they're, they're depressed, they're, they're sad. The first thing I usually ask is like, are you doing anything physical? Do you have any hobbies? Are you going to the gym? And usually they say no. And then what I usually say is get a hobby. That's physical. You either go to a gym, or go surfing, go rock climbing, do something physical. Get outside of your head. Get outside of uh, your room, your house, and that that physical thing usually allows you to take the m main focus of just being in your head to doing the, that, that physical work, and that helps mm -hmm. you kind of process things better. So, how important is physical health to your mental health? Oh, there. Uh, I mean, the evidence that comes out now, it's pretty much one and the same. Um, Again, speaking on like the internal processes that 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 occur when we're under stress, we the thoughts that we have, like if you're having a day where you're feeling more negative thoughts or feeling um, intrusive thoughts, unwanted thoughts, that's that's people don't realize that that's coming from eighty percent of that, or that is coming from the eighty percent of processing, which is from your body, from the bottom up. Like when we talk about having a gut feeling, mm -hmm. that's really from how safe or in danger your body feels. And we have this storytelling mechanism of the brain that wants to wants to give a, a narrative to what we're feeling in our bodies. So a lot of times people think that, oh, I feel better because I'm thinking differently. It's like, no, you're, th you're thinking more positively because your body feels better. Mm -hmm. um, so the body comes first. And again, that's a two-way, there's a two-way connection there. Um, you know, your nervous system is why has wired connections both ways. So, but the mind follows the body and then the, and then the body can follow the mind. The mind follows the body from there in, in a cyclical way. Um, but in our, in our most basic form, our, our emotions, um, things evolved to our emotions evolved to feel things evolved to feel good or bad based on how uh, relevant that activity or behavior was for our survival. Mm -hmm. So things, something felt good to increase the likelihood that you did that thing again, because it was good for your social connectivity, which meant that you were better able to survive uh, physically because um, you were better connected to a group. Things feel bad when they're not good for your, for your physical survival, they're not good for your emotional health, your, your, social connectivity um because then that would lead to a higher chance of you um <clears throat> being physically harmed mm. so when you look at your emotions that way it's really e it's, it's much easier to see what it takes to be happy um when you look at happiness in in, in uh in a, from the perspective of it being a state that you're in and not something that you can like reach out and grab it the prerequisite for it is safety you have to feel, you have to feel safe. Usually the more present you are, the safer you feel because the more present you are, the easier you can handle what comes your way because you're actually engaged with that current reality. Um, so I think safety is always a prerequisite and uh, for, for that happiness, for your ment for good mental health. So treating your body with safety, like nourishing it properly, hydrating it, making sure you get enough of the elements, um, you know, the sun, all of those things that you, again, you hear very pop are very popular today. Um, but people kind of overcomplicate those things. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they think that there's a very specific recipe or that they have to, they have to overdo all of those things to really be happy, but it's really not that complex. It's, it's simple. Um, we were made of the same thing that everything else in this world is made of. It's just a different, you know, obviously a different, um, different compound structure. But when you engage with the outdoors, you engage with nature. Um, that's not just 
a spiritual like woo woo kind of like fad in society that's really making it easier to be happy because you're because you're being connected um to the present and the very thing that you are made of so so, so yeah. being happy seems very simple and it's a state that you could get into a lot just like you said creating safety so we're talking a lot about creating physical safety what about from a mental standpoint so what if there's somebody that had a traumatic experience and or maybe is slightly depressed how do we cultivate safety from a mental level when your intrusive thoughts are telling you not to be safe how do you rewire your mental state so you're aligned with safety and feel happiness right so that you can you can actually are you asking like how do you know that you're safe when you're actually safe and how do you know that when you're how do you know when you're in danger when you're actually in danger yes is what you're asking yeah yeah so that in trauma um trauma definitely interrupts that it can create an illusion that you're safe when you're actually da in danger and that you're in danger when you're safe um so th again that starts with the like the basic building blocks of your men of your mental health which is your body to feel safe uh br breath work again is going to come into play here um with with just kind of creating more harmony within your body and that all your systems are working together. Um, but it's really, you, you can't access those, those types of insights uh, to create that, that mental health until your body is relaxed. So it always, again, it always starts with, with relaxing your stress response um, or discharging energy that's been stored, you know, that's been bottled up over time. Um, and I apologize if this is going to kind of shoot in different directions because it's all from that that polyvagal theory about uh, a good way to remember a piece of that is just like this what they say about the city, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, mm. and that's referring to so V A G U S the Vegas nerve, that is your nerve complex that um, that is respond that's your built in surveillance system for what's safe and what's dangerous and it's got tons of fibers that connect to your extremities to your organs and basically controls the flow of energy in order for you to move towards safety or move away from danger and when we have uh, a stressor that 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 um that requires us to discharge that fight or flight response um, and we don't get to release it it gets stuck there so instead of completing the cycle and you knowing that, you know, okay, like I'm no longer in danger. I, I was able to, I was able to give a response to that stressor. It just continually sends that signal of danger so that in situations where you're actually safe, your body is still signaling that there's something dangerous. There's something threatening. Um, so it's always going to come down to just regulating your bot, your stress level in your body. And then, building the um the insight on top of that to align your mental health to, to to align your narrative and your you know the story and how you what your thoughts are um that's the easy part after getting the body back online okay i love that. that's a great way to explain it because it's so easy to catch yourself in these intrus intrusive thoughts and just like we talked about sports and the peripheral vision it's just you get into fight or flight and then like the emotions take over i don't know how to explain it but emotions almost like create a blanket over you and it's so far it's so hard for you to uh, break the label right of what that emotion mm -hmm. is telling you like that's that's anxiety that's happiness it's a to, smoke screen yeah it's a smoke screen yep. and you're just so paralyzed and people don't realize that we have two independent organisms you just got to mm -hmm. consciously be like okay this is what's happening and self-awareness it's uh it's it's very tricky it's hard to explain for somebody that doesn't understand psychology it's like hey how do you break this <laughs> yeah. feeling i'm experiencing yeah because i'm glad you, yeah it's a very good point because i'm thinking about it i'm like feelings can be very physical and when you start thinking you're anxious you start feeling anxious you're like i really am anxious because i feel it in my body and it's like almost like you got to take a step back and look at where does anxiety come from is it a physical threat? It's not a physical threat. It's just you and your and, and, and your mind. And that's eliciting that response. So the fact that the feelings are started from within, from a mental aspect, and then it shifts your physical, it almost feels like that is a true reality. 
I am this mm-hmm. ancient human because it's not only in my head, I'm also feeling it. So this is like my true self. And that's like a false thing because the moment you stop feeling anxious is the moment you stop getting these anxious symptoms. So and people get caught up with that, with those feelings, because they're we're very, very um, uh, run by our senses. Yeah. Whatever we, we could see mm-hmm. is there for sure. Whatever you could feel is for sure real. Like my arm's cut off, I have pain there. My arm has to be for sure cut off because there's pain coming out of there. But feelings are the mm-hmm. same thing. I'm, I'm shaking, my heart rate is up, it's, it's elevated. I'm anxious, I, I, I am anxious because I'm feeling this way. But really, you're not, you're, you're not. There's nothing, nothing changed physically only thing that changed is you emotionally and, and mentally. That's the only change that, that that was. So you don't have to put that arm back in. You just have to change the way you think to, to fix that, fix that feeling from yeah. occurring in a sense. Yeah. No, but, but yeah, what you're talking about is like the kind of how our emotions make our consciousness. Mm-hmm. And it's um, when you start to identify with them yeah. instead of just seeing them as a uh, signal, you know, they... The word emotion is just energy in motion. It's just 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 the fuel that that guides all the behaviors and, that we do. And mm. um, when you don't identify as that emotion anymore, and just see that, well, that's just my response mm. to something. There's something in the environment is telling me, um, you know, that this is a good or a bad idea. Um, but that's not what I identify as. Like, what you're talking about is the difference between um, seeing anxiety. Um, cause this is a problem in, in the mainstream that anxiety is not a personality trait. It's a, it's just a, it's an emotional response, but people really over identify with like, they say, I am an anxious person as if it's fixed mm. and not that they're just experiencing a surge of anxiety because there's something unresolved. Um, and they're not, uh, they're not able to process from the top down that, you know, that's an illusion that they're, you know, there's a difference between something being important for you to focus on and something being threatening. And there are, there's a huge overlap today of people who feel threatened by things that are just important that, you know, just from the demands of life are important to, you know, uh, like test anxiety. I mean, interviews, you know, something like, even like this, like before I came on and like, I know what I'm talking about. Why am I so anxious? Like it's threatening me. And then, you, and then that's when you use the top down regulation of like, well, it's important to you. You know, this is your career and you like talking about these things and you want to have a good conversation. So it's important. Um, and just shifting it that way. That's, that's a way to then feel your body relax after that, that there's nothing organically threatening about a situation it's just that it can make you it's important that you do it because it because you value it it matters to you and once you shift from threat to import just being important you'll notice the decrease in the heart rate the core temperature cools off you know your breathing slows down those sweaty palms kind of dry up um you get the lump out of your throat you know so it's pretty quick we can we do have the ability to regulate ourselves very rapidly but what you said really um, reminded me of that, that people are um, in a, it's kind of an epidemic of just feeling threatened by things that are not really threatening. Maybe we could talk a little bit about the age of information right now, since we're on this topic and very nuanced Mm -hmm. thing. Uh, Something I realized that's a problem in our society, social media, for example, right? Not only is it hindering our dopamine and our feel good chemicals, but also we go on it right away instead of giving ourselves maybe gratification that we're good enough that we're worthy for the day we go on this we compare right away we see things other people's lifestyles are living such a great life and we put ourselves down in the hole is there Mm -hmm. any other problems that you see in the current age of information yeah i the biggest problem i see with the age of information is the speed uh with which people expect answers to some of their biggest problems um the fact that we can google anything that we we really don't need to store as much information in our working memories anymore because we can just look it up um i know people who have ever since gps's came out kind of have forgotten how to get places without it where before that they used to be able to get there and on the same uh you know they used to be able to get there by just cognitively mapping it um but now that translates over into some of life's biggest problems or not, I shouldn't say problems. Like a lot of the things that I think give meaning to life, like the, 
the nuanced questions, the, philo the, the existential uh, philosophical thoughts that people have, you know, what does this all mean? Uh, how do I navigate this difficult friend relationship? What do I do when I get my heart broken? Um, you know, all of the complex social issues that our, 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 our um, society faces, if you Googled them, you might find step-by-step -step instructions on how to handle like things related to that, but you're not gonna get like a, uh, here is what you do in your specific situation to feel better. You have to sit with it and kind of let that, emo you know, let those feelings from those experiences flow until you arrive at, at the insight. Um, and sometimes life's biggest questions are actually not able to be answered and like dealing with um, being able to sit comfortably um, with the fact that there is no one way to look at something and it's not always able to be answered is, is actually a big, big component of the therapy that we do as well. Mm -hmm. um, after we kind of calm the somatic responses to trauma that's where all the insight comes in um, and like helping people accept what's happened um, and that there's not always a way to kind of make gray out of black and white. You kind of have to make plaid in that the two sides, you know, there's more than two sides to a situation, but let's say for example, uh, purposes of this example, if there's two sides to the story and they oppose each other, they don't, they, keep, they don't always have to mix to create some universal truth. It's just, you know, this, this is both of these things mm -hmm. and neither one cancels the other one out. And that uh, becomes very hard for people to do in the age of information because they want an answer. They want to look up something very quickly. So um, there's a, there's a rush to, to get answers for things that there really isn't um, a specific answer. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's definitely heightened the level of anxiety that people have. I mean, even with, even with EMDR, like it gets, uh, EMDR is typically is in the mainstream. EMDR is known to be uh, a much faster way of getting over um, trauma and different anxieties. And even then, we find ourselves telling people constantly, like, "Yes, it's traditionally faster than talk therapy, but you still have to wait a little bit. You still have to like take some time. Uh, you know, we can't just. It, there's no way to." kind of put in a, a binary time frame on it. Mm. With the e EMDR, why is it such a, why does it have such a quicker response rate? Is it, does it help with like the neurotransmission? How does that, that um, how is that like an, an anatomical way more efficient than just like sitting down and talking to somebody? How does that like affect your brain? Right, so when you're, when you're stuck in a traumatized <clears throat> or, hmm. So you're like everything in your conscious mind, like everything that you could recall, if somebody said, tell me the story of your whole life, like all of that, all your, all your conscious thoughts, that's all information mm -hmm. um, that starts in raw sensory data in the form of your five senses, uh, images, emotions, where you felt those emotions in your body. And that just like how um, computers are like hundreds or thousands of lines of coding, but you don't see that when you just open an app, the app just opens up. But you don't see all the coding that went into how that app opens and does what it does. Mm. So our memories, similarly, we just recall it. We don't see the process of how it got there. Um, tr traumatically stored memories are still stuck in those like fragmented states in the right hemisphere of the brain. And we don't realize I've talked about this before, like the way that your thoughts are kind of fed by your, the state of your nervous system and your body, just talking through something with someone who's getting a continual signal of danger from their body. They're just going to keep it's, um, it's the example I've heard it referred to. It's like, it's like watering leaves of a tree instead of the roots and expecting mm -hmm. it to grow. Um, you're not getting into what actually, you know, you're not getting underneath what the real problem is. Um, you're just kind of chasing your tail, just trying to talk your way through something that is, you're consciously experiencing it as a negative thought because it's because it's stuck in your subconscious. So what EMDR does with the bilateral stimulation, you know, the, the typical way, the way it's portrayed in media or most people have been explained 
is like you follow a light back and forth, you move your eyes back and forth. Um, and what that does is it kind of mimics what happens in REM sleep, which is where we detach emotions from our experiences. Not that we forget how we felt, but we're not currently feeling that same feeling at the time of the event after the event is passed. Mm -hmm. uh, you're able to remember, like you can remember how you felt when somebody asked you about that story, but you're not actually still viscerally feeling it in the present. Mm -hmm. um, so the bilateral stimulation allows for that processing that got disrupted by the trauma um, to keep going and make its way to your long-term memory. So that when someone asks you about that experience, you can speak to it and actually feel it in the past, not actually be hijacked by that feeling in the present. So if that makes sense. So it's yeah. like Viktor Frankl said, uh, between stimulus and response, there's space. So it sounds like mm -hmm. this therapy is creating space between the emotion, you're able to separate the label of what that emotion means to you, and you become the observer of it, so you can formulate your own story, right? Exactly. You're re just like yeah, you're rewriting a story. Um, that's our just that's our most most uh one of our most essential parts of our nature is to be symbolic to tell a story it's uh that storytelling mechanism of the brain which is where i think that's the only reason we still refer to things as theoretical in this field i mean we have so much evidence like neurobiologically speaking um of, of the way things fire but we still can't touch that part of your mind like you can't go into somebody's brain and say oh here's where you know Here's where they chose to uh, create the painting that they did to express the trauma that they experienced. That's something so complex we don't, we can't, we can't tangibly prove it, but we know it exists because millions and millions of people have done, uh, have been doing it for as long as we know, and they can continue to do it today. Um, the way that we write our story is we want it to flow, we want it to have a theme, want it to make sense, even if that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best for us it's the best story for us if it makes sense we will prefer to believe that rather than something that is more true mm -hmm. but doesn't fit the narrative so think about if you're writing a story if there's 20 chapters um and you write the whole you write 20 cha 20 chapters but you you go back and you rewrite chapter 12 with a different theme and it's like well the theme so far was that this person has been powerless in their life through the 20 chapters but in chapter 12, we rewrote it so that while they felt, you know, the theme is no longer that they are inherently powerless, but they felt powerless in a moment. And also here are all their examples of where they've also been powerful and, and, and how that's not true. You change that chapter, chapters 13 through 20 would likely have to be rewritten. You wouldn't be able to just change the middle of the story and then keep the rest of the story exactly the same. Mm. So that's kind of like what we're doing with the MDR is going back to there's the desensitization, which just kind of takes the experience out from behind your eyelids. I guess if you know what I mean, when I say that, like stop reliving it, but then also rewrites what you learned from that experience for you in a more positive, more adaptive way. So what you learned about yourself from that experience is no longer just being blanketed across all of your other perception. It's specific to that moment. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to kind of zoom out from it and kind of observe it more, hover over it and see yourself as a more adaptive person that doesn't have to feel that way because the story has been rewritten. Yeah. Damn. yeah. Mm, that's that's awesome. Good. Yeah. And we were talking a little bit before the show about martial arts and mm -hmm. uh, that kind of a, that kind of a sport. So I'm curious, if you could talk a little bit about what you've learned or how your martial arts journey um, is, is, is coming along. Because when you you mentioned a little bit ago something about being too comfortable or, or being comfortable. And this might resonate with me because I'm reading the David Goggins book. And David Goggins always says to, you know, stay hard and always be uncomfortable. Something mm -hmm. about if you're too comfortable, you lose your purpose. And, and also what comes to mind when I, when I say that is that if you're too comfortable, you end up getting murdered. Because I, I remember when Matt and I used to like look into like these uh, conspiracy theories and, and things like that. And it's like someone always got murdered because they got, you know, too comfortable with their day to day, -day activities. So like, for example, yeah. for my martial arts journey, what, what I've learned, and maybe you learned the same thing as well, Matt, is, is every time I go to class, doesn't matter if, if I spar or just hit pads. 
it's the hardest physical thing I, I do that day. And for some reason, by doing that hardest physical thing that day, I feel like I just won a war. And everything from then on just feels so much better. It's almost like I just survived something and I appreciate life so much because for some reason I survived because I'm not saying I could have died in martial arts class. I'm just saying it's just, mm -hmm. it was just so hard and, and required so much physical, physical strength and mental will. Is this the hardest thing I, I did that day? And coming from that is like almost coming from battle and like nothing else really phases, phases me throughout the rest of the day. Like I could take on more stress for some reason, just because I took on that, that battle. So I'm curious as to maybe why that happens or have you felt the same way or maybe do any of your clients feel that, feel that way? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm gonna tie in just some of the other things that I've talked about so far into this as well. And big picture, we live in a world that is, yes, of course, dangerous at times. There's, there's a definitely a reason to keep your head on a swivel. Um, but compared to the hundreds of millions of years that we lived where we really were in life or death situations, moment to moment from wake to sleep, um, our, the signals that we get like anxiety, depression, like all of the, all of the things that we call quote unquote mental illness, all of that, um, is really just a manifestation or a lot of it is a manifestation of this ancient like uh, like archaic parts of our nervous system that are no longer really useful because we no longer have to act out of, in those extremes to survive. Um, that's why that newest branch of it evolved, the social engagement system, because we're able to just cooperate and like call out for help or like signal with a facial expression to someone that we need help. We're able to press pause and you know deal with something later on. Um, we don't have to act imminently all the time but we still have these two very strong and active branches of our nervous system that, um, that fire all day. Um, so martial arts is kind of hack. It's like biohacking. It's kind of releasing all of that stress that I talked about before that can get stuck in that system. It's releasing it. It's making you better able to defend yourself, even though, um, most people, and unfortunately, yes, it does happen. Um, and I know it's happened a lot more recently, um, kind of worldwide, like just things typically are more violent than it, than it seems like it used to be, um, at least in our generations. And, uh, when you're doing martial arts, you're training yourself to be pretty much be dangerous if you needed it, but also the ability to control it. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more confident than that. And if you can, um, you know, even though there's not, there's not a very strong likelihood that you'll need to use it to defend yourself that way. But if you're ner if you're, if the primitive parts of your nervous system know that you can, then it doesn't need to fire the same way. It trusts that if a challenge comes your way, you can handle it because you've been trained and you've created a habit. It's a pathway in your brain that you're able to respond to danger in this way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I recommend it to pretty much everybody that um, that has some kind of pent up energy or some kind of traumatic stress response in their life. I mean, even you don't even have to have PTSD to, to, for it to be beneficial for you. It's also being about being proactive. Like I said, like if you're, if you're training yourself to be able to handle the physical, you know, like a physical threat, because we experience social threats in the same part of our brain as a physical threat. When you, re when you're trained that way, you're able to handle social, your social anxieties even better because the, at the primitive level that like in that, that processing that I talked about, like the computer coding in the early stages of that processing, your, your body doesn't know the difference between whether you're somebody's holding a pad for you or you're actually fighting to defend yourself. Hmm. You make, um, a, you make I know, a you make a very good point because when I'm when I'm training jujitsu, I've learned to cultivate and harness my breathing so much better because mm -hmm. whenever someone's about to choke and there's they're slowly advancing their hand, you know, they're you're about to get choked out. You just feel your body just start that rush, you start breathing heavy and you realize when you don't control your breath, that's when you get tired and you actually mm -hmm. end up losing. And another aspect of that is just how grounding the activity is itself. If you have yeah. somebody that struggles with an ADHD brain or just kind of focusing in the present moment when you get out of a martial art 
you're very focused, very sharp. There's a lot of clarity. Whatever bothered you before, all that's out of the window. And you've, you just are yeah. very relaxed for the rest of the day. I, exactly. I just, was just talking about this with one of my friends that I go to class with the other day that you could, your, your house could be on fire in front of you. And if you're, if you're training, you're like, ah, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it. Mm. I'll deal with it when it comes time to deal with it. Like it's, it's, it's incredibly hard to, to focus on anything else when you're kind of locked into that flow state of somebody trying to hit you. Um, and you know, basically dancing with someone and kind of creating a rhythm around each other. Um, but it's when it's like hit or be hit or kill or be killed, it's very, very hard. It's almost impossible. Um, at least in my experience so far, I mean, I can count on one hand how many times maybe I've, you know, in between drills, like my mind just drifted somewhere else. But for the most part, that hour is just locked in mm -hmm. to, to, to whatever it is that we're doing. Um, I haven't tried jujitsu yet. Uh, I'm a little hesitant just because I have some like orthopedic stuff from the football that I've mm -hmm. done. And I know that that's a higher chance of like getting those kinds of injuries, but I've been mostly into uh, Muay Thai and um, in Dutch kickboxing mm -hmm. and just the, I just wish I started it earlier. Uh, I haven't played football in about 10 years and I just wish I went right into this, but um, that was, I guess that's kind of, a cool part of the story too, is I'll get to look back and say, like, uh, I was kind of searching. I think I was searching for that, that, um, that rush that, that those contact collision sports really give you. Um, and I didn't get it or I was getting it from like just weightlifting and doing other kinds of intense workouts before, but I kind of hit a wall. Maybe it was COVID. Maybe it's the demands of this type of work. Um, but when I took my first Muay Thai class, it was like, you know, just what we were talking about before that was as real a signal for my body as ever that like, this is it, like, this is the thing that's going to keep you going. You know, this is, this is for you. Um, so I suggested to all of my clients, um, there's documented evidence and other, but uh, other trauma experts have talked about like people who severe panic disorder that visit the ER multiple times a month. Um, I think, um, you know, like the, like the, the grandfather of, of PTSD diagnosis and trauma informed care, Bessel van der Kolk mentions one of his patients in, uh, in the body keeps the score that, that famous book that he had someone that had 12 ER visits, uh, in a year for panic attacks. And she started kickboxing. And I think that number shrunk down to three just within a year. Um, and then after that, she eventually got to a point where she was just no longer panicking. Um, so it's really, really gives evidence to the fact that, when you're, <clears throat> when you're a formidable force, but you can control it, there, there's, a, there's just an extreme level of confidence um, to navigate life that comes with it, you know, even in situations where you don't have to fight. Yeah, it's something about, I don't know who said this, but something about it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war kind of thing. Like, Worst yeah. case scenario, at least you have this basic knowledge of how to defend yourself. And for some reason, that and the physical strength it takes to do it, it's just for some reason makes you so much more, more grounded. Yeah. And, you, and, you, and you said that like the whole violence thing is, is you learn almost an appreciation for violence and what you can inflict on somebody, you learn. You're like, damn, I can do this to somebody. I don't want to use this unless I have to. Like I don't want to fight right. for fun. I, I'm not going to just go to a bar and try to mess with somebody like that's not what it's for you yeah. get this appreciation for it like like so rooted in you where you do not want mm -hmm. any kind of violence in, in, in the world someone just right. calms you right. and those guys that are in the want gym to, yeah you don't want to yeah you, the guys you are don't in even, the, yeah gosh you don't even want to I, I think that's i think that's the way it works that you can see i i light up over it um yeah. <laughs> like that's that's why because when people who go out looking for fights anyway are are it's not about the guy that looked at you the wrong way or stepped on your shoes. You already went into that. If that's what you get into a physical altercation over, you've got, you were already primed to respond that way long before you got to this social event. When you, when you get your stress, you deal with your household issues and, and release them uh, and get that stress out, you go into social situations, not even feeling on guard from anybody. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you're still like paying attention to who's around you. But again, it's just in this regulated like flow state of, yeah, if someone tries to hurt me, not only do I know that I can defend myself, but I can defend myself and keep it at the bare minimum to defend myself because we see too many times people in acts of self-defense end up taking it too far because they can't control the rage that comes out when you're defending yourself. They end up hurting the person even worse and then they get in trouble. And then you, now you've got a whole other thing to be anxious about, okay. um, you know, because we live in a litigate society and um, people get in trouble all the time for just defending themselves because they did too much. Mm-hmm. So training martial arts also allows you, you know, especially jujitsu, um, to really like completely subdue somebody, but not injure them mm. and not, not cause more damage. You do the bare minimum to, to defend yourself. And then there's no legal action after that. Um, but that, that's like, I lit up before because that's precisely what that training does is it makes you like, they're all the instructors, like, like they're like the chillest people mm-hmm. too. Like they could kill you with their bare hands in a blink of an eye. And they're like a third of my size. Um, but they're just the most relaxed, mm-hmm. just charismatic people. Um, and that speaks to like how our nervous systems communicate when somebody's got um, you know, good energy. Um, you can sense that you can definitely sense that that's something that I've picked up as well for, for anybody out there that's looking for, you know, that they feel intimidated by a public gym or a heavy weightlifting or the classes at a public gym don't really get it done for them. You know, go to a, um, like a close knit martial arts studio mm-hmm. and you'll feel, you know, hopefully feel very welcomed very quickly and, uh, and feel like you're a part of something. And it's, um, even though it's people fighting, it's less, in, it can be less intimidating mm-hmm. than like the public, public fitness um, environments. Yeah, people think they're gonna get beat up, but trust me, people that have been doing it for a while, they don't have any intention of, of beating you up. They're, yeah. they're less inclined to, to beat you up because like, for example, if you're sparring with somebody or you know, holding pads and someone's less experienced, it's almost like you get a little break. You're like, all right, for sure, he's, he's new, I don't have to go as hard. So you, you respect that and you kind of touch it more on your fundamentals. No one's ever out there to, you know, try and try and get you. We have the luxury of, of having Dean Lister come to come to our gym and I got a handful of opportunities to talk to him in, in the sauna and calmest, more, most chillest guys guys in the world. And whoever watched UFC didn't know Dean Lister was a killer back in the UFC, you know? So it's yeah. like, you're just like, damn, so you're like a killer out there in the octagon, but then you're just so calm and willing to teach, willing to explain things on how to do things, show me things in a sauna that a guy that you, you just met. It's just, mm-hmm. it's like a very, very humbling experience. Awesome to have that. brotherhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even speaking about the Maslow's hierarchy and needs, like you guys were talking about after, you know, food and everything, their safety and security and having a martial arts is able to calm you down in that level of Maslow's hierarchy. So you could focus on friends and family mm-hmm. and then self-esteem. But without that, you always may be paranoid in a social setting or whatever it is because of not feeling ultimately safe in your own body. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's only safe to connect once you're safe within yourself. Yeah. 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 I mean, martial arts is great. Like I had a, one thing that also um, resonated with me when you said it was about the weights. It's weightlifting. Mm-hmm. Some like for me, weightlifting was super exciting, and then for some reason, it came to a point where it's not that I disliked it. I still enjoyed it, but the enjoyment level wasn't as high a, as it was because for weightlifting, it's just you and the weights. The weights only go one way: the way you push them. And what mm-hmm. martial arts provided, it's like, it's still weights because you're still being physical and you're still pushing up on something physical, but the weights are also coming at you. So it's, so now you're adding not only weights to, martial arts doesn't only, only allow to you to like lift weights in a, in a metaphorical mm-hmm. sense, but those weights are, are also pushing up, up against you as well. So now you're not even pushing mm-hmm. weights. These weights are also trying to have you move a certain way. So when I did that, yeah. I was like, oh damn, this is a lot like lifting weights but the weights are coming at me and I have to defend myself from these weights. I, I have to like, you know, block these shots. Now I mean, do I have to kick you and push you away from me? I have to also defend myself from you pushing against me. So that was like a drastic improvement. And then it got me back into lifting weights because I was like, okay, there's this guy that's smaller than me, but for some reason he's quicker than me and, sh- and stronger than me. Like, how does that happen? So now let's hop back on the weights and try to get stronger. And it's almost like this, like this balance you're trying to, you're trying to push yourself as hard as you can cardiovascularly wise and then you're also trying to push yourself in like a strength wise so you're almost mm-hmm. doing this like physical dance with yourself 
And that's just yep. super, super motivating because you're improving on all aspects, your speed, your strength, like your power, your mental game. And it's like, sometimes you see somebody that, that like you call a couple of times, you're like, okay, it's gonna be easy fight. And you have a farm for like a month or something and they come back and you're like, damn, he's a lot quicker. So it almost, almost makes you step it up again because it's like, damn, I thought this guy was slacking off for a month, but he's not, he's actually been, been training. So it's like, damn, what am I doing? How am I still on the same yeah. level? And this guy took a month and he improved. Now I got to get back into it, you know, but it's like a humbling, yeah. it's like a respect. I'm not trying to get one at him. It's just, I'm trying to always just improve my level just for myself, just so I know yeah. that I'm good. Right. Again, you're, you're, you're attacking the, like our most primal senses in that we wanted to be part of, we, not only do we need to connect to a group, but we wanted to be part of a group that could also defend themselves. Mm -hmm. Like who do you, you know, when you were gauging who to, who to hang out with, uh, you know, millions of years ago, you'd rather hang out with somebody that was better, uh, was going to be better able to help you hunt mm -hmm. and build and carry their weight. Um, so when you're working well with someone and you see that they're very skilled and they're pushing you to, you know, increase your skills, that's again, that raw, like true form of happiness in your body and the safety that like, yeah, I'm part of this, I'm flowing with this like harmonious group of people that know how to defend themselves. Um, and it's just, I mean, any way you look at it, it's, uh, you know, short of just how much it hurts sometimes to go shin to shin with somebody, sure. but even that, even for pain tolerance, like, you know, the, the mental battle of, you know, understanding that pain is also a signal that something needs attention. Um, but separating the story from it and learning to control your anger in response to something that really hurts and that the person wasn't trying to harm you. That's just part of the sport. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah, man, we could talk forever about just all around self-control, um, mind, body, spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, martial arts, way to go. Yeah, the biggest self-control thing that I've noticed is when I got hit in the face a couple of times, as you get so angry. Yeah. And then once you learn yeah. how to just be like, okay, I got hit in the face, let's move on. You know, because I was I was used to like, every time I got hit, I always want to hit him back, like get it back. Right. And it's like, it's not the point. Because if, if they get you and you hit it back, you're almost like, feeding into their, their defense. And they're going to keep catching you. They keep getting you out those counters. So it's about that thing where just take these hits. Just know that you're eventually going to hit them back. Right now is not the time. Just take the hits. Calm down. Stay calm. Don't try to get back at them. Just be relaxed. It's not a big deal. You got hit in the face. Move on. Let's, let's try to keep this thing going. And that was like, like, mm -hmm. a, like a mind, I don't know, like a giant realization where I don't have to always hit you back if you hit me. As I can stay content, mm -hmm. I can stay composed and, and just wait patiently. It doesn't phase me. It hurts me physically, but it doesn't hurt me mentally. You just keep going at it. Right. And that's translatable to life because mm -hmm. life, life hits us all the time. But it's not always the best idea to just impulsively react mm -hmm. right away. Yep. That's we have this. That's again, that's why we are so complex. We're so, so advanced um, in so many ways because we can we can feel something pause and like develop a response to it um over time mm -hmm. so on a smaller scale in fighting you get hit and you don't just rage out and attack the person you get hit and you're like oh okay and you feel that you feel the feeling of being hit and you let that continue to fuel you and um have it be part of the plan of attack mm -hmm. uh, or or a reactionary attack to the next move that they're going to make so when life does that you you, you know you learn that there is a time and a place to be very reactive and there's a time and a place to be responsive mm. instead of just reacting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Be like water, my friends. Yeah, yeah, because it's like, because <laughs> like when, because it's something that I slowly getting over time, maybe like the last month, because I've been doing uh, Muay Thai for since like March. Um, mm. I wish I would start started sooner like, like you, but one thing mm. that I've noticed me picking up on more is not necessarily getting hit, but how they hit me. So it's like, at the beginning, I started a little bit more defensive. So it's like getting me with, with that jab, but how are you getting me with that with that jab? And if you are getting me with that jab, what can I do to to um, to negate that? So do I have to move a certain way, or do I have to maybe throw a cross when you jab? What, what, what I have to do to prevent that jab from from hitting me, and how and how do I do that? Is learn how you're throwing that jab. Where are you coming mm -hmm. from? Is your is your are you throwing like a far jab where you're leaning over? Because if you're leaning over with that jab, I could probably catch you with my jab a little quicker than than you can. So it's so it's more like not not focusing on getting hit it's more of like how did they get you how did they throw it so you could figure out a way to either either hit them quicker or just come with a counter is it uh is it timing 
It depends on the timing. So, like in jiu-jitsu, they say that the difference between the belts is just timing. Yeah. The quicker you can time yourself from a counterattack or defense or sweep or get him in a submission, that's what differentiates you from a white belt, blue belt, purple mm. belt, and so on. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, timing is, a, is, a, is very important, yeah. Yeah. The, the, best, the best example of the overlap between, um, like, mindfulness, uh, martial arts, and, and, like, just how our brains work tying going all the way back to what you originally asked about being in that like elite mindset um when the pressure is on was i think it was i can't remember who he was fighting but khabib had somebody um in an arm bar and you, you know you think about what what your body is signaling at the end of a fight you know and how much you can really think in those in those moments and he said after the fight that the reason why he switched out of the, he, he let the guy go and 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 uh, beat him by submission a different way um, was because he had heard that the family was in the stands and he also remembered that he had said he would never tap out he would let somebody break their arm he would let him break his arm before he tapped out mm. didn't want to break his arm in front of his family so he made this switch to win the fight a different way mm. and and I for if there's any um, like UFC fanatics out there that, and I messed up any details of that story, I apologize. <laughs> but for purposes of this example, just that level of walking the middle between, you know, between your left and right sides of your brain, like just being that much in the zone to be able to physically hold yourself in those positions, exert yourself the way you need to, but also travel into those, some of those thoughts thinking about what he said in the press conference, thinking about family, um, you know, having the heart to not want to do something that might be traumatic for people to watch, but still win the fight because that's the objective. Mm -hmm. Just that, the complexity in that is just, there's something to be said for that. Um, and obviously that comes from a lifetime of experience, but um, I just always thought that was the most fascinating um, and like great example of how much working on living mindfully and practicing mindfulness uh, can really um, really help an athlete, but also just the way that those two feed each other, you know, by doing them both. Oh, that's insane. That is a high level of mental capacity to do that. Yeah. And, and to, you know, separate yourself from that stimulus and just be observant of what you want to do. One last question we'd like to ask all of our guests. So if you had the opportunity to have a cup of coffee with anybody one last time, who would it be and why? So I thought about this a lot and I thought it would be kind of cliche for me to pick an athlete. So I wanted to pick somebody that maybe not a lot of people have heard of, but um, is a, I believe he's in his mid nineties now. Uh, his name is Irvin Yalom and he is a psychiatrist from, um, I believe he was at, worked out of uh, Stanford university and he's like the grandfather of, existential psychotherapy um, and had a really, really unique approach to, to helping his patients um, with what, with whatever ailed them. And, you know, this, however, how old he is, like psych, the field of psychiatry has changed an enormous amount since he was probably coming up in training. But what he, what he posed was that no matter what somebody comes through these doors for, no matter what's going on in their life, that people seek out therapy um for one of for a confrontation with one of four givens of existence and that's that we have free will um whether things are meaningless whether life is meaningless um fear of oblivion like there being nothing afterwards and fear of disconnection disconnecting from from your peers from your social groups uh no matter what someone came in with you could always find a way to boil it down to one of to, to there being a issue with being able to confront one of those four things. And this guy, he, you know, he's a psychiatrist, but he writes like a philosopher. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a chance, he, he's written a memoir, multiple books on existential, uh, existential philosophy and existentialism within psychotherapy. Um, and I would just love to sit down with him and just pick his mind about different cases that I have. I mean, my own questions, um, dream analysis, uh, you know, death anxiety, just a lot of the things that like are really, really uncomfortable for people to, to approach. And he just so 
with such nonchalance just talks about them. Um, and it almost feels like he's just kind of comforting you at times uh, when you're reading what he's written, uh, but also he doesn't sugarcoat things. Mm -hmm. It's like some of his, some of his work is stuff that I wouldn't always read before going to bed, but, um, <laughs> but I would love <laughs> to kind of wake up and just, uh, and just talk to him and be like, yeah, man, what's it all about? And, and just kind of see what, you know, and people would say somebody that old too, like they just are automatically smarter than you. Like if you're, if you've lived for almost a hundred years, like you just, the, the amount of wisdom, um, through all those years of practicing as well, mm. uh, doing this work. Yeah. So Irvin Yalom, I, I would 100% love to sit and have a cup of coffee with. Yeah. Sounds like an interesting guy. I'm definitely going to look into him after this, uh, this episode, but Sean, yeah. um, where can people find you when they, when they want to reach out to you? So, um, you can look at, uh, I, <laughs> I don't have like a, I don't have any social handles for my prep for like the therapy that I do, but our practice page, um, it's our, our practice is peaceful living mental health counseling and the Instagram, um, username is peaceful living counseling. Um, you can also go to peaceful living, uh, mental health counseling.com. And we have a blog on there as well. Um, which is updated monthly with different blog posts about, um, I mean, I've probably written about a lot of what we've talked about today as well, but um, my contact information, email, my work phone, all that stuff is all on our website. So it's peaceful living, uh, mental health counseling or in Scarsdale, New York. And uh, we have, you can also check out the EMDR coach. Um, that's Dana, uh, the, the founder and uh, the owner of the practice, um, she has a, t it's just the EMDR coach separated by underscores. And she's got a ton of resources and, you know, interactive information um, that are things that I've echoed today. And also uh, just more information about all things trauma informed questions about EMDR, literally anything, anything related to this work. Sean, we just want to acknowledge you before we end the show that you are a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for getting on, sharing all your experiences and your knowledge about sports psychology, about EMDR, about what it takes to cultivate a mental identity of a true athlete and the performance. I think anybody listening to this show understands the mind of an athlete now. And thank you for sharing your experience with about mixed martial arts. So yeah, maybe we'll see you again. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you guys very much for having me. And I'm, yeah, I'm glad we got to talk about that stuff at the end. I didn't know uh, that you were both like active participants in it as well. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out again. And uh, yeah, I really, really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun awesome. answering your questions. Awesome. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you.